there's no chill in the air. And on warm August nights, when you turn off the light, you can see her standing on the stairs. She laughs as she glares into the guest room upstairs. And she quickly moves down to the parlor. And if you're very quiet, a muffled sob fills the night. When she whispers, you disappointed me, father. mother 40 wax and when she saw what she had done she gave her father 41 you know i must have been around seven years old when i first read that verse the legend of lizzie borden had traveled time and distance and culture and found his way to atwood oklahoma population 60 although i'd argue that my little town was the cultural center of the universe some folks might find it incredible that a hundred-year-old murder case from New England could be so well-known in the hinterland. But arguably, the Lizzie Borden case is the most famous in American history and folklore, and worldwide, only Jack the Ripper is more famous. Now, it's, it, it's difficult to explain why a case captures the imagination, but the Lizzie Borden case is the thing of which legends are made. So travel along as we go back to 1892, Fall River, Massachusetts, and the legend of Lizzie Borden. There were no less than 200 Borden families living in Fall River in 1892. Judge Robert Sullivan took liberties with the famous quote when he wrote, In Fall River, the Durfees and Brayton spoke only to the Bordens, and the Bordens spoke only to God. The house at 92 Second Street was the home of Andrew Jackson Borden, his wife Abby, and two spinster daughters, Lizzie and Emma. Andrew Borden was a tall, thin man of 72 years. He was tight-fisted and miserly, and his family lived well beneath his means. His first wife, Sarah, had suffered from unusual spells and had died when Lizzie was two years old. Abby Durfee, a 37-year-old spinster, was his second wife and stepmother to Lizzie and Emma. A short, heavy-set woman, it was difficult to see what Andrew and Abby saw in each other. Everyone knew that Andrew married Abby because he needed a full-time worker, and Abby needed Andrew's money. Between them, they brought together the two most influential families in Fall River, the Durfees and the Bordens. The Bordens' house was not the palatial estate that their name suggested. Although Andrew was very wealthy, the Borden home was as bleak and austere as those in a Dickens novel. They lived near the business district, not on the plateau called The Hill, where the socially elites resided. It must have been horribly dismal. Uh, yet, to live under those circumstances and know that your father is very rich must have been very irksome. Uh, the house itself, and I think this is a real, real strong evidence of how stingy the man was. If you remember, the 1890s were known as the gaslight era. They didn't have gaslight. They could have had electricity. They didn't have running water. They didn't have toilets. They didn't have a bathtub. And in the 1890s, middle class people had those. And certainly people in his financial condition could have had that and a lot more. They had hand pumps. They had a pump in the kitchen. They had a pump in the barn. They had water closet in the basement. Uh, the toilet arrangement in the basement is what I would call an indoor outhouse. And there was
was a big pot in the basement into which rags, dirty rags, were thrown. Lizzie had a maid to talk to. Bridget was a pleasant, sort of outgoing uh, Irish woman in her mid-twenties. Emma was very quiet and very reserved. And you would have had two environments, the working class people and the upper crust society. Lizzie Borden was trapped between these two societies because her father was a miser and they lived in the working class society. And she always wanted to achieve the ultimate goal of climbing the fashionable hill and living with the upper crust. Perhaps symptomatic of a darker, more sinister side, Ms. Lizzie Borden had another problem. She was also a petty thief. Lizzie would go to McCours and shoplift. Uh, it was so well known that the clerks would watch her, make a list of what she stole, send Andrew the bill, and he would pay for it. The daughters were jealous of their stepmother and looked upon her as an interloper and a threat to their inheritance. Lizzie especially exhibited a brooding hatred with sudden outbursts of hostility towards her stepmother. After an argument over property rights five years before, Lizzie no longer called Abby mother, but rather Mrs. Borden. The older daughter, Emma, was 42 years old and still lived at home. She was dominated by everyone around her, especially her headstrong younger sister. On the other hand, Lizzie Andrew Borden had inherited her father's name and his chilly disposition. She was red-haired, bright, ill-tempered, and arrogant. At 32 years, she felt life was passing her by. With a sizable allowance of $4 a week, she despised her father's miserly ways. On any given day, you could see Andrew Borden dressed in morning clothes, making his daily rounds, personally collecting rents, while at the same time selling eggs from a basket that hung from his arm. The only jewelry he wore was a gold pocket watch and a small gold ring that Lizzie had given him. Mr. Borden always stopped at his three banks and the newly completed A.J. Borden building. The hot, muggy morning of August 4th, 1892, was little different from others. But the previous day had been a day of unusual events. It had begun when Abby Borden paid an unscheduled visit to Dr. S.W. Bowen. Members of the family had been sick recently. Mrs. Borden came to me Wednesday morning and said that she was very much frightened, for she thought she had been poisoned. She and Mr. Borden had vomited all night, and she feared the poison had been from the baker's bread or the milk. Miss Lizzie and Bridget had been sick with the same symptoms, and it was their belief that an enemy had attempted to kill the whole family. Later the same morning, Lizzie visited a drugstore and attempted to buy a deadly poison from druggist Eli Bentz. This party came in and inquired if I kept prussic acid. I informed her that we did. She asked me if she could buy 10 cents worth, and I says, well, my good lady, it is something we don't sell unless by prescription from a doctor, as it is very dangerous to handle. I understand she wanted to put it on a sealskin cape. Lizzie's unusual conduct continued during an evening visit to her friend Alice Russell. During the evening, Lizzie came to see me. She came alone and stayed till about 9 o'clock. She spoke of her father and mother and her being sick the night before. Lizzie said, sometimes I think our milk might be poisoned. Mrs. Borden thought she had been poisoned and she called Dr. Bowen to treat her. Lizzie spoke about believing her father had enemies and spoke of a man who came there and wanted to rent a place and of a quarrel. Then Lizzie said to me, I am afraid somebody will do something. I don't know, but what somebody will do something. After Lizzie returned home from Miss Russell's, she found that her uncle John Morse was staying the night at the house. Emma was visiting friends in Fairhaven and would be gone a week or so. That night, a neighbor was awakened by a cracking of wood from the fence on the Borden property. It continued for four or five minutes. Then it stopped. And the house on 2nd Street slept. lawyer Lizzie Borden will continue.
morning of their lives, Andrew and Abby Borden came down around 7 a.m., followed by Uncle John Morse. Bridget, Abby, and Andrew were nauseated, but managed to eat a hearty breakfast of cold mutton, mutton soup, bananas, Johnny cakes, and coffee. This was the third day the mutton had been served, and the third meal in a row. Mr. Borden and Mr. Morse left shortly after nine. Lizzie rarely meals with Abby and Andrew. She simply refused to honor them with her presence. Soon she came down, stayed a few minutes without eating breakfast, and disappeared for an hour or so. I saw my mother when I was downstairs. She was dusting the dining room. She said she had been upstairs and made the bed and was going upstairs to put on the pillow slips. That was the last time I saw her alive. Lizzie Borden. Abby walked up the stairs shortly after nine. She never walked back down. Somewhere in the house, someone waited. were kept locked and Bridget Sullivan washed windows outside for an hour or so and then moved inside. A little before 11 I heard Mr. Borden try to get in at the front door. Miss Lizzie was upstairs at that time. I went to open the door and it was locked and I made some exclamation and Lizzie laughed aloud. I heard her tell her father that Mrs. Borden got a note and went out. I wasn't feeling well so I went upstairs to my room and lay down. In a few minutes Lizzie hollered for me. She hollered loud. Maggie, come down quick. Father was dead. Somebody came in and killed him. She told me to run after Dr. Bowen, who lived across the street. I saw Bridget Sullivan going to Dr. Bowen's house and appeared frightened. I looked out to the Borden house and saw Lizzie Borden standing inside the screen door. I asked her what was the matter. She said, somebody has killed Father. Oh, do come over. I went over and went into the house. I put my hand on her arm and said, Oh, Lizzie, where is your father? She said, In the sitting room. I said, Where were you? She said, I went out to the barn to get a piece of iron. And in a few moments, Dr. Bowen came. This is Adelaide B. Churchill. I hurried across the street and entered the house by the side door. Alone, I walked into the sitting room, and there I saw the body of Mr. Borden on a lounge. His position was perfectly natural, and he appeared as if he had just lain down to sleep. I was impressed at this point with the manifest absence of any sign of a struggle. I am satisfied that he was asleep when he received the first blow, which was necessarily fatal. The cuts extended from the eye and nose around the ear. In a small space, there were at least 11 distinct cuts of about the same depth and general appearance. In my opinion, any one of them would have proved fatal almost instantly. The physician that I am, and accustomed to all kinds of horrible sights, but it sickened me to look upon the dead man's face. I am inclined to think that an axe was the instrument used. There was some blood on the floor and spatters on the wall, but nothing to indicate the slaughter that had taken place. At this point, I returned to the kitchen and inquired for Mrs. Borden. Miss Lizzie replied that she did not know where her mother was. Mrs. Churchill volunteered to go upstairs with Bridget. Before they reached the landing, they could see a body in the guest room. They ran back down the stairs and told Dr. Bowen. Mrs. Churchill suggested that I go upstairs, which I did, entering the front room. As I passed within, I was horrified to see the body of Mrs. Borden on the floor. She must have been engaged in making the bed when the murderer appeared with an axe or hatchet and made a slash at her. After that, she turned, and the fiend chopped her head as if it had been a cake of ice. 
One blow killed the woman, but the murderer kept on hacking at her until he was satisfied that she was dead. I easily made out 11 distinct gashes of apparently the same size as those on her husband's face. In my judgment, the dead woman did not struggle. So far as I know, I was alone in the house the larger part of the time while my father was away. I was eating a pear when my father came in. Then I went to the barn to get some lead for a sinker. I went upstairs in the barn. There was a bench there which contained some lead. I unhooked the screen door when I went out. I ate some pears up there. I picked the pears from the ground. Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden would tell conflicting versions of where she was and what she was doing when the murders occurred. The barn loft was examined. The dust in the floor had not been disturbed, and it appeared no one had been in the loft for some time. Was she looking for sinkers or a piece of iron to fix a screen? Was she in the backyard or in the loft? She would also say she heard a groan from the house and ran inside and discovered her father. Then she said she heard a scraping sound. And finally she said she heard no sound or noise at all. Lizzie's behavior was curious, and to a few who dared to think it, even suspicious. As the news swept through Fall River, thousands gathered before the Borden House. City Marshal Rufus B. Hilliard and District Attorney Hosea Knowlton found themselves in the most thankless job of their lives. First of all, I think the Borden crime was the first murder in American history to be covered by the electronic media. You've got to give me the telegraph. But it was telegraphed around the country very quickly. Uh, newspapers picked it up in New York and Philadelphia and Boston almost immediately. Uh, the news was broadcast as rapidly as one can imagine. I asked Lizzie Borden if she thought that Bridget could have done this. And she said that she didn't think that she could or did. She said no, that Bridget had gone upstairs previous to her father's lying down in the lounge. And when she came from the barn, she called her downstairs. I then asked her if she had any idea who could have killed her father and mother. And she said, she's not my mother, sir. She's my stepmother. My mother died when I was a child. Deputy John Fleet. The newspapers chose Uncle John Morse as the prime suspect. The suggestion would almost cost his life. His whereabouts were verified with absolute certainty. That left only Lizzie. But Fall River's social elite were not capable of such a crime. It was, after all, unladylike. And what about everyone's target in the bottom step of the social ladder? The Portuguese. Dear Mr. Knowlton, it is very clear that the Portuguese love money. For while all liars are not murderers, all murderers are liars for sale. Anonymous. By afternoon, the Borden house was crawling with policemen, reporters, officials, and thousands of sightseers, and everyone offered advice. Dear sir, why don't you consult a competent phrenologist and ascertain if either of the members of the Borden family suspected of murder of A.J. Borden has a formation of head which would tend to murder under favorable conditions. No man or woman deliberately plans or executes a murder without having the organs which inspire murderous inclination largely developed. Very truly, M.T. Richardson. Dear sir, why not clear up this dreadful mystery by an examination of the retina of the eye of one or both of the murdered parties if either were conscious at the time of the murder? The last object seen by them will be found impressed there. Dark, mysterious cases have been brought to light in this manner by the means of photography. Respectfully, a detective. The police found several axes and hatchets in the Borden home. One hatchet found in a box by the furnace was more curious than the others. The handle had been recently broken off and the head appeared to have been washed and covered with ashes. Incredibly, the policeman returned the hatchet to the box and left it. Five days later, another officer rediscovered it and took it as possible evidence. While standing in the parlor, District Attorney Knowlton made an interesting discovery. On a small table was a very interesting book. They had what we would call a medical book. And 
find the spine was broken so that if you dropped it on the table, it would automatically open up to wherever the, the spine had been broken to. And that page listed the, a description of prussic acid and what it could do. Country lawyer Lizzie Borden will continue. slowly soaking in. Every member of the household had an ironclad alibi except Lizzie. The unthinkable was now considered. Except in whispers, no one had courage to pose the question, did Lizzie Borden murder her father and stepmother? That afternoon, one of the more macabre events took place in the Borden home. Shortly after three o'clock, the doctors placed wicker, muslin cloth, and canvas on the dining table, and the bodies were autopsied. It was determined that Abby was killed about nine o'clock that morning, and Andrew one or two hours later. In other words, Abby was dead at the time Lizzie was explaining her stepmother's absence.